thank you so much for that introduction. I'm happy to be here, uh, or not there, but here, giving this talk. Can you see my screen here? Yes, we've got it. Okay, all right. So I wanna talk about the window of stroke care. Um, I have no conflict of interest to report, no off-label use of any devices. Um, just some minor stroke facts. As you know, it's one of the leading causes of death in the United States. Uh, there is hundreds of thousands of uh, deaths per year in the United States, three quarter of a million strokes per year, many million stroke survivors. And it's a, one of the leading causes of adult disability. And uh, of the patients who survive stroke, 90% will have some type of deficit. Now there's two types of treatment for ischemic stroke. There is medical treatment, which Dr. Eckerley just uh, talked about uh, in his talk uh, um, several times, and that's intravenous TPA basically. Um, it's a clot busting medication to break up the clots that are blocking flow into the blood vessels in the brain and try to rescue the brain. And it's been shown to work. And I'm gonna talk about briefly about that. The second type of treatment is interventional treatment, which is what I do and Dr. Yao and Dr. Gyasi, the endovascular neurosurgeons do. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. So th those are the two modes of treatment. Let's talk about medical treatment first. Uh, IV TPA, you're all familiar with it. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that has been shown uh, with randomized controlled trials to be effective in improving patient outcomes if it's administered within four and a half hours of uh, last known well or stroke symptom onset. Um, this was uh, the, the, the study that that reported on this improved outcome was uh, published in the England Journal of Medicine in 1995. It was done by the NINDS. And so basically this is a level one evidence that if you give TPA within four and a half hours to eligible patients that you think are having stroke, they actually do better, their outcome is better. And there's no disputing that. Now, um, that, sets, that sets our treatment window medically to four and a half hours. Uh, obviously, uh, clinicians, uh, scientists have been trying to push that uh, window out further, push the envelope a little bit. I'm going to talk briefly about a couple of trials that are trying to do, or that try to do that. Um, the first one is the wake-up trial. It was a randomized controlled trial, two groups, uh, placebo versus IVTPA. Unknown time of onset. Um, the way they did this was they tried to find patients that probably had their onset of stroke symptoms four and a half hours ago, but it's just that nobody knew when it was. So as a proxy, they used MRI by looking at diffusion restriction uh, imaging on MRI that showed there was an acute stroke and then looking at the flare imaging. And if there's no flare signal that you can age the stroke based on those two uh, imaging modalities. And you can tell, well, that's, it's a pretty recent stroke, but it's not been more than four and a half hours or so. So these still fall within the four and a half hour window. It's just that it makes more patients eligible than we would have before because these are the patients that no one knows how long um, uh, they've been having stroke symptoms. They wake up with it or you know, someone hasn't seen them for a while. Um, primary outcome was a MRS score of zero to one at 90 days. So good outcome at 90 days. Secondary outcome was ordinal shift in the group MRS uh, scores at 90 days. Uh, you can see in the table below that uh, in the placebo group, there are 250 uh, patients in each group. In the placebo group, there was 41% uh, good outcome patients, 53% in the IVTPA group. So there was a significant improvement or uh, increase in the patients having good outcome at 90 days. So this was a positive result. Symptomatic ICH, as you'd probably expect, was a little bit higher as 4% versus 1.2% for the placebo patients. And deaths was a little bit higher, 2% versus 0.4%. Again, this shows that these people benefited from IVTPA. It improved their outcome, uh, which is not surprising because we think all of the patients that were included in this, in this study were uh, presented within four and a half hours of last known well. Uh, but it does open up this treatment to people where there was nobody uh, witnessing their onset of symptoms and just trying to use the MRI as a proxy for time. So we're still within that four and a half hour window. We know it works and it, it shows in this study that it works. Uh, IVTPA helps improve outcome. The second study was the EXTEND trial. This was, uh, uh, the last one was published in 2018. This is in 2019 in New England Journal of Medicine. This was also a randomized controlled trial, placebo versus IVTPA. Uh, the patients randomized four and a half to nine hours after onset of stroke. Uh, you know, this is much further out than uh, any previous studies with IV, uh, IVTPA. And same primary outcome, uh, good 
uh, functional outcome at 90 days, zero to one on the MRS scale. Um, the thing that they used for this study was they used advanced imaging, CT perfusion, and rapid software, like we use at Norton uh, Healthcare, uh, to aid in patient selection. So they only selected patients for the study that had small core infarct based on CT perfusion and large, relatively large ischemic penumbra at risk brain that needed to be saved. Um, there's over 100 patients in each group, and you can see that the uh, good outcome a percentage of patients with good outcome is a little bit higher in the IVTPA group, 35.4% versus 29.5% in the placebo group. Uh, symptomatic ICH, intracranial hemorrhage, actually went up significantly as well in the IVTPA group in this time frame, four and a half to nine hours. It was 6% versus less than 1% in the, in the placebo group. Now, uh, this is a randomized control trial published in the England Journal of Medicine, providing some level one evidence that, you know, taking IVTP out to nine hours actually um, helps improve outcomes, but I have some significant problems with it, or a lot of people have significant problems with this study. First of all, it's very underpowered. The secondary endpoints were not met, so you don't see any ordinal shift in the MRS scale. And uh, the thing that I have the most problem with is, here, here are the characteristics of the patients in, in this study. Median time from onset of symptoms was seven hours. Okay, fine. More than 70% of patients in both groups had large vessel occlusion as seen on CTA. And average core infarct size was four ml, so very little stroke that's already completed. Average ischemic penumbra size was 70 ml, so large at-risk brain. And patients were only randomized to this trial if they were not being considered for um, uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Well, the question, the obvious question is why were they not considered for mechanical thrombectomy? All of these criteria signify a patient that would definitely benefit from mechanical thrombectomy based on the uh, studies that I'm gonna show in a little bit. So that's the biggest problem I have with this. It does show improvement up to nine hours uh, if using IBTP as far as functional outcome, but it's a, this would not apply in real world situation at Norton Healthcare, for example, because these patients would all go for, for mechanical thrombectomy and they would not just go into an IVTPA arm under any circumstances. Um, I'm going to talk about interventional treatment for stroke next. Uh, here's a, just a video. Uh, well, I'm going to, yeah. Uh, here I'm going to show you, this is basically a cartoon of the intracranial arteries, uh, carotid artery going into the middle cerebral artery. Uh, we bring up the catheter from either the radial artery, the femoral artery, up into the distal cervical carotid artery, then through the catheter, we bring up a microcatheter, and we go through the blockage. You can see the clot inside what is in this cartoon, a left middle cerebral artery. Um, and then um, we deploy a stent retriever, which is a mechanical thrombectomy device. Um, within the clot, what it does is it has radial force. It basically pushes the clot up against the wall of the vessel and then the clot starts extruding into the lumen of the stent through the interstices. We leave that up for a few minutes and then we basically remove it. We inflate a balloon in the guide catheter and the cervical carotid artery so the blood is not going anterograde towards the brain. In fact, we aspirate through that catheter so the blood is actually leaving the brain and going into the catheter and into a syringe as we're pulling it out. The purpose of that is so that when we pull this clot out, as if pieces break off, they don't go forward into the intracranial circulation, they get sucked back into the catheter and into a syringe. So we try to decrease chance of uh, trauma embolic uh, phenomena during this clot removal. After this is done, obviously we deflate the balloon. And uh, so, that was basically uh, how we do a regular uh, mechanical thrombectomy and eventual stroke care. I'm gonna briefly touch on the major clinical trials that showed that this was effective in improving patient outcomes. The first one was called the Mr. Clean trial out of the Netherlands uh, several years ago. It was the first randomized control trial that actually showed uh, improvement in outcome in patients after mechanical thrombectomy for large vessel occlusion. When I say large vessel occlusion, I mean, uh, internal carotid artery in the brain, the intracranial internal carotid artery, the middle cerebral artery, um, the basilar artery, those are large arteries in the brain that if blocked would have, would cause devastating large strokes with significant deficits. So those are the, 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 the blockages that we are addressing with these mechanical thrombectomy um, trials. So Mr. Clean trial, uh, randomized patients to either best medical treatment versus endovascular thrombectomy, like I just showed, 
um, best medical treatment includes IVTPA. So these patients uh, got IVTPA if they, um, if they uh, qualified for it based on the inclusion criteria. Now, this, this trial was up to six hours. Uh, the inclusion criteria was up to six hours from last, last known well. People could, have, uh, could be randomized to either group. And here you can see that vessel recanalization in the interventional group, which is the blue bar, is significantly higher than the, the, the medical best medical treatment, including IVTPA. So with med best medical treatment, you have a little bit over 30% vessels being recanalized. In the uh, interventional group, you have 75% uh, vessels being recanalized, which is significant. But does this lead to better functional outcome, better neurological status? Um, the NI stroke scales at 24 hours and at seven days, there's a significant decrease between the control group uh, to the interventional group. That means these patients had a decreased NI stroke scale at 24 hours, decreased NI stroke scale at seven days, which equates to much better neurological exam at those time frames. Um, these were secondary outcomes. Dichotomized MRS score, uh, looking at functional uh, recovery uh, in patients in the interventional group compared to the control group, you can see that uh, significant higher percentage of patients that got intervention, which is the blue bar um, at each of these uh, MRS intervals, a significantly larger percentage of the interventional group patients had a better outcome, had a good outcome as far as if you, if you consider good outcome MRS of zero to two or zero to three compared to best medical treatment. So the outcome significantly improved at 90 days in the patients that got intervention compared to the best medical treatment patients. Um, then the question is, okay, so now we've shown a very significant improvement in patient outcomes, uh, both in the short term in the hospital and also at 90 day interval as, uh, as measured by the MRS scale. Is there something that we uh, have to accept like increased intracranial hemorrhage, increased death, increased complication because we're doing this invasive procedure? And the answer is no. Um, all safety measures were equivalent in the control group and intervention group, including intracranial hemorrhage, including death, there was no significant uh, increase in intracranial hemorrhage with this endovascular procedure. So because of this, because the Mr. Clean trial and uh, very significant uh, positive results, uh, there were four other trials that were ongoing, uh, randomized control trials looking at uh, the same type of thing, uh, interventional therapy for uh, large vessel occlusion. They all stopped recruiting. They did a term analysis and they published all their results all in the same um, issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. And, these trials were the SWIFT, Swift Prime trial, Extend IA, Revask, and Escape. Um, this is the different time windows from last known well where patients could qualify for these trials. You can see six hours, just like Mr. Clean, six hours for Extend IA, eight hours for Revask. And the one that had the longest uh, uh, time frame was up to, uh, it was Escape. And uh, you can see, all of these patients, uh, all of these uh, trials uh, basically showed the exact same thing as the Mr. Clean trial. They showed that there was a huge, huge increase in the percentage of patients that had good outcome after uh, mechanical thrombectomy as opposed to medical treatment. So because the escape trial had the longest uh, uh, time of uh, inclusion, I'm gonna briefly touch on that. Uh, this went out to 12 hours from last known well compared to the six hours for a lot of the other trials. Um, they use CT and CT angiography to uh, exclude patients with large core infarcts or poor collaterals. They did not use advanced imaging, which we consider something like CT perfusion in this study. Um, you can see uh, in the escape study, again, up to 12 hours, there is a significantly in increased percentage of patients that have revascularization, 73% versus, well, the bar should be here 30%. Imagine there's a bar at 30% here for control group, for the best medical group. Uh, 70, only 30% were able to open the vessel with IVTP and best medical management and 73% of the interventional group were able to open the blood vessel and leave it open, keep it open. As far as good outcome as measured as MRS score of zero to two at 90 days, huge difference in good outcome. 53% of the interventional group had a good outcome compared to 29% of the IVTPA alone group. And uh, mortality, there was actually a de significant decrease in mortality with intervention, 10% versus 19% uh, of the uh, best medical treatment. And symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, no difference, no statistically significant difference between the two groups. And all of the other uh, uh, 
trials that I just mentioned had very similar results, but this one is significant because it went out to 12 hours from last known well. Um, this is just a graph showing the kaplan meier curve of mortality showing significantly, statistically significant reduction in mortality with, this, uh, with the mechanical thrombectomy intervention. Um, so at this point, the time window for stroke treatment had moved out to 12 hours, interventional stroke treatment to 12 hours. The question is how about further out than 12 hours? Um, those uh, are being uh, were addressed by a couple of trials I'm gonna talk about. One is DAWN trial. The second one is a diffuse three trial. So the DAWN trial was a randomized controlled trial that was able to, people were able to be randomized between six to 24 hours after last known well, which really significantly extends out that, uh, that, that time window for us to be able to do mechanical thrombectomy. Um, and uh, again, large, large vessel occlusions. It was a randomized controlled trial, one-to-one -one stent retriever, which is mechanical thrombectomy device versus medical management. Um, and again, all of these trials, if a patient, whether whether they were in the control group or in the or the interventional group, if they qualify for IVTPA, they would receive IVTPA. So that was not taken off the table. Um, 500 maximum subjects. Uh, the way that the study worked was within six to 24 hours from last known well, the patients, if they presented uh, to the stroke center, they were um, um, screened. Uh, inclusion criteria was NI stroke scale greater than or equal to 10, uh, pre presenting MRS score of zero to one. So the patient had to have good, good uh, functional status on presentation. Um, as you can imagine, these inclusion criteria are pretty stringent and it would, it would actually rule out a a lot of patients that may actually benefit from mechanical thrombectomy. There's plenty of patients that have a lot of deficits that don't have an NI stroke, stroke, stroke scale of 10. There would be nine, eight, seven, someone who has aphasia. Uh, they would not qualify for, for, for this study. And also, uh, I think a patient that has an MRS score of two at baseline might be considered someone who could benefit from a you know, life-saving procedure. In any case, uh, this, these are the inclusion criteria for this study. Uh, the important thing to note about the study was that advanced imaging, mostly CT perfusion with the rapid software, which was what we use here at Norton, was used to uh, select out patients that would not benefit. So the patients that already had a large stroke volume, core infarct, they would not be uh, selected for this study because they would not benefit because it was an increased risk of hemorrhage and uh, not less, in, uh, less risk, less uh, chance of improvement. So the way they did that was uh, patients that had a high NIA stroke scale, greater than or equal to 10. If the core was less than 31 cc's, that's a pretty small stroke actually, 31 cc's. Then they could qualify anything bigger, they would not. If it was a very large NIA stroke scale, they took that uh, threshold to 51 cc's. Again, relatively small stroke compared to um, um, some patients. So these were one-to-one -one randomized and then uh, half the patients went to the best medical management, half of them the mechanical thrombectomy. Um, here is the primary endpoint, which is uh, which shows that thrombectomy has significantly improved functional independence as measured by MRS score of zero to two compared to standard medical treatment. So if you got thrombectomy, there was a, almost a 50% chance that you had uh, a good outcome. If you didn't get thrombectomy, very little chance, 13%. That is a huge, huge treatment effect. Um, there was also, uh, ranking shift if, on an ordinal basis, if you look at the uh, MRS scores, significantly more people would have uh, MRS scores of uh, zero, one, or two in the thrombectomy group versus the, uh, the control group. And the interesting thing is they did a sub-analysis between, uh, between the patients that had a six to 12 hour before randomization since last known well versus 12 to 24 hours since last known well. And the question was, well, it, are we seeing the effect because it's all the early patients that are improving? Well, the answer is no. Patients that were uh, randomized that were 12 to 24 hours since last known well also had a significant improved outcome, significantly increased number of patients with uh, zero or one or two MRS scores. Now, not as pronounced effect as the six to 12 hours, but still very significant. Uh, secondary endpoints, uh, the patients in the mechanical thrombectomy uh, group had a, four, a two and a half times uh, more of them would experience a greater than 10 point decrease in high stroke scale. So 48% of the patients uh, in the interventional group would, would experience this huge drop in an high stroke scale, which means a huge improvement in neurological status, neurological exam. Uh, 
only 20% of the medical management patients had that huge drop in NI stroke scale. So it really helped uh, as far as the patient's neurological exam in the hospital. Um, and as far as revascularization, same as all the other uh, studies, 77% for the interventional group, 39% for the uh, medical group. Safety outcomes, again, um, pretty consistent with the other trials, even though this, this trial went up all the way to 24 hours, right? Uh, there was no difference in stroke-related 90-day mortality, no statistically significant difference. There was no statistically significant difference in symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. There was a significant dec decrease in neurological deterioration. So less patients had neurological deterioration if they got intervention. More of them got neurologically worsened if they didn't get intervention. So what are the conclusions of the DAWN trial? Significantly higher percentage of patients will have a good outcome with mechanical thrombectomy. It's 48.6% versus 13%, which is a humongous uh, treatment effect. And for every 100 patients treated with endovascular therapy, 49 will have less disabled outcome as a result, uh, including 36 who will be functionally independent, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, now the, Interesting thing is that the treatment effect size in this DAWN study is actually the highest of any of the stroke trials that I just mentioned before. And what this suggests really is that using advanced imaging, in this case, the form uh, is mostly CT perfusion, uh, by selecting patients better that could potentially be helped, you can get a much better uh, treatment effect. You can do much, much more good. Um, and the treatment effect persisted to 24 hours since last known well. Um, Limitation of the DAWN trial, I kind of mentioned them very briefly. One of them was the NI stroke scale was set at pretty high. Uh, if they were below 10, they did not qualify. And I think a lot of people uh, would take patients with less than 10 NI stroke scale for mechanical thrombectomy with good, good results. Um, the other thing was uh, the core infarct that they, they had uh, for inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria was relatively low. Someone with 50, 51 cc's, how about somebody with 60 cc's of uh, core infarct, there, they could still benefit from mechanical thrombectomy where you save a large uh, portion of at-risk brain and uh, prevent further disability. Also MRS score zero to one, that's pretty restrictive. So excluded all the MRS scores uh, to patients at baseline. The last study I'm gonna talk about is Diffuse 3. Um, this study had time frame of six to 16 hours from last known well, um, not as far out 24 hours as, as, as uh, Dawn trial, but uh, further than any other study before. Uh, the thing about this study was that it was much more inclusive than the Dawn trial. The pre-stroke uh, pre MRS scale could be zero to two, not zero to one like the Dawn. And the NI stroke scale could be greater than or equal to six, not 10 like the Dawn study. So a lot more patients could be uh, uh, included in the study. And this is a little bit more real life uh, kind of uh, uh, criteria. Um, and you can see good outcome as measured uh, by MRS score of zero to two, huge difference in the endovascular group. Uh, you get 45% of them have good outcome. Only 17% of the best medical group, best medical treatment group have a good outcome. This is uh, up to 16 hours. And then as far as severe disability and death as defined by MRS of five to six, you can see a much little, uh, smaller percentage of patients, 22% of the patients in the interventional group had a poor outcome or death whereas 42% in the control group had poor outcome or death. Um, the revascularization, same as pretty similar to other studies, almost 80% of the endovascular arm, they were uh, revascularized, the vessels were open. At the end of treatment, uh, only less than 20% of the medical patients had uh, revascularization of the vessel with best medical treatment. Um, symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage and death, uh, Symptomatic ICH, endovascular, and medical uh, arms, not statistically significant. There was a significant, statistically significant decrease death in the endovascular arm compared to uh, control. So intervention did significantly decrease death in patients. Um, there was no difference between wake-up patients in this uh, group of uh, patients versus witness onset patients. They both had similar treatment effect. Uh, which is odds ratio of 3.4, which is huge. Um, the conclusions from the Diffuse 3 study, uh, it extends the late window therapy for a larger population of patients because uh, what that I mentioned that it was a, a lot more inclusive than the very stringent DON trial uh, criteria. Um, 
and this this also shows the impact of advanced imaging in the form of CD perfusion, for example, in being able to select the proper patients for the best effect. Um, now, based on these last two trials that I just uh, mentioned, the treatment window for mechanical thrombectomy has been taken up to 24 hours. This is based on level one evidence from randomized controlled trials that is really irrefutable. Now, does it mean anybody coming after 24 hours can't be helped? Absolutely not. The 24 hours is because we have a clinical trial that used that as a cutoff. That there's no magic number about it. In fact, I think time is really irrelevant. It has to do with the personalized uh, kind of uh, assessment of the patient and using advanced imaging to see if they've had a stroke, how big the stroke they've had, and if there is ischemic at, at risk brain penumbra, ischemic penumbra, and how big it is, and if it's worthwhile um, uh, saving that penumbra. So I'll give you an example of a patient, um, 78 year old man presenting with a lot of medical problems, more than 24 hours uh, last since last known well, right hemiplegia, aphasia, gaze deviation, and facial droop, NIH of 26. Here's the CT, uh, non-contrast CT, like Brian was talking about, is one of the first things that these patients get in the emergency department because it's important to rule out a large hemorrhage or mass lesion that could be causing you know, mass effect and those symptoms. It's relatively benign. Um, here's a CT angiogram of the neck showing um, complete occlusion of the left carotid artery in the cervical spine, in the cervical region. This is the in the neck. And looking up intracranially, you can see you're missing the left internal carotid intracranially as well. That's clotted off. And uh, here's a CT perfusion on the purple on the left uh, that measures cerebral blood flow less than 30%, which is a proxy for core infarct. That's the brain that has already uh, suffered irreversible damage. That's, that's the stroke part of the brain, that's the purple. So he had a small stroke, but you can see the green on here, which is Tmax greater than six seconds, which is a proxy for ischemic penumbra at risk brain that hasn't actually died, but it's at risk of dying because it's having less perfusion, less blood flow than it needs. You can see there's a, a very large ischemic penumbra in the left hemisphere. This corresponds to the patient's symptoms, obviously, aphasia and right hemiplegia. So um, in this patient, what we did was uh, we went in through the uh, uh, femoral artery up into the uh, carotid, left common carotid artery. You can see that it, it is occluded, the internal carotid artery is occluded here. So first thing what we did was we put an angioplasty, that carotid artery and stented it open. Then we went through the stent up intracranially and did a mechanical thrombectomy of the intracranial carotid artery and opened that. And this is what the stent retriever looks like with a clot on it. Um, this is the clot they will retrieve. This is what it looks like. Here's the, you can see the outline of the stent and then the catheter that goes through the stent. And then um, this is how we did the mechanical thrombectomy. This is what it looks like afterwards. Uh, the cervical carotid is wide open, the intracranial carotid is wide open, all the branches are there. And in this case, uh, the patient had a tiny little stroke right here. You can see on diffusion restriction and made a complete recovery right away. Um, so basically uh, the take home message is mechanical thrombectomy really, really uh, improves patient outcomes in uh, properly selected patients using advanced imaging. There is no time frame that really, uh, there's no magic number clinical trials go up to 24 hours, but we will certainly intervene in patients that are further out than 24 hours if advanced imaging shows that there is at-risk brain that can be saved and we can make a difference. Um, the end. Is there any questions I can answer for you? Dr. Cooper, I think you're muted. Yes, thank you, I'm sorry. I was saying it was amazing. I spent most of my career with a time window of three hours. So it's uh, really remarkable what we can do. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one I think you'll answer pretty quickly. How soon could a patient be safely mobilized after reading, after receiving uh, IV TPA? Mobilized for what? Uh, I would, let's say for transfer to another hospital. Oh, I see. Uh, I, they can be mobilized immediately. So a lot of times when we have a patient, you know, we are a church free care referral center, obviously at Norton Healthcare, and we get a lot of patients brought in by helicopter or by ambulance from surrounding regions. And a lot of times they, they, they might be a primary stroke center or a stroke ready center. They're able to triage the patient and give them IV TPA. So they call, they talk to our stroke neurologist, they might get a uh, just a reassurance on, on, on the phone with them and they go ahead and give, start the IV TPA and then immediately put the patient in the ambulance or, or in the helicopter and bring him over. 
which is the right thing to do. You want to give IV TPA if uh, the patient qualifies for it because it can it can it can possibly help. And also during that time of transport, uh, there's nothing else that you can do for the patient. But from a practical standpoint, I want you, I want you to understand that when you have a large vessel occlusion, this IV TPA most of the time does nothing to it because you know you have a large clot in there. This IV TPA goes through your artery and just tickles the back of it. Does nothing. So really, that patient will need mechanical thrombectomy. But as far as pre, uh, transferring patients, very quickly, immediately, as soon as the IVTPA started. And then, uh, am I correct? Uh, we would probably start uh, physical therapy about twenty within about twenty four hours. Is that correct? Yeah, abs absolutely. Yes. So uh, the sooner that physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, all of the therapies that are necessary are started, the better that the patient will do. And uh, um, uh, it's a, it's a, that's a big part of the care of these patients. Uh, you know, what we do is sometimes like the patient I just showed, we prevent a giant stroke from happening to no stroke or a tiny stroke and the patient is actually perfectly fine. But a lot of times what we do is we take someone who had had a massive hemispheric stroke and instead of that, they had a smaller stroke. They'll still have some deficits, but they can recover from those deficits through physical therapy uh, over several months. Whereas if they had had that hemispheric stroke, they would have no chance. They would be hemiplegic, possibly even die. So yeah. therapy is a big component of, of, of the stroke care for these patients. Now, I know we're keeping everybody late, but there's one other question that, that I would love to get your input on. Is there a role uh, for anticoagulant use in embolic stroke or post-embolic stroke for ongoing management? And if so, for how long? Uh, that's not such a simple question, but I, I'm interested in your take. Uh, well, like what situation are you talking about? So give me an example. Um, you know, I was reading off the uh, list, but, but, but let me make up a scenario. Okay. If, uh, if someone has atrial fibrillation, they had a stroke and, and we believe it likely is a, a cardioembolic source. And let's even take it a step further and say that it's uh, an MCA thrombus and you're able to remove that. At what point would we uh, look at using anticoagulants in that scenario? Yeah. That's a very good question. And it's a very common scenario. One out of three patients, maybe one out of four patients at least uh, that we do mechanical thrombectomy on, is it, it fits that exact scenario. So uh, what we do is we try to unblock the blood vessel that is blocked to try to save that brain. And then the patient uh, goes up to the ICU and then we evaluate. It takes a few hours to figure out how that patient is going to be doing. If they uh, are moving the, the side that was plegic or they're doing much better, then we can tell clinically that the patient maybe didn't have a stroke or didn't have a large stroke, which is a good thing. If they're still plegic, they still have significant deficits, you know, then uh, scan obviously uh, sometime later, CT or MRI will show how big the stroke was and what the prognosis is. And the other thing to, that we pay attention to is if there's a stroke, is there any hemorrhagic transformation? And that will determine how soon the anticoagulation starts. There's no magic number. There's no magic number. The next day, two days later, three days later, it's kind of an art. Um, uh, but uh, we, the smaller the stroke is, the sooner theoretically you can start the anticoagulation within a few days. Sometimes uh, the primary care physicians will wait a week or so, or even longer if there's hemorrhagic transformation, because you, wanna, you don't want to make a hemorrhagic transformation any worse. Unless the patient has a massive clot in their heart, if you think about it, uh, the risk day to day from AFib causing stroke is relatively small, but it accumulates over a long period of time. So we do it as soon as possible, no magic number. We extend it a few days or a couple of weeks if there's significant hemorrhage in the brain. Okay, but that makes a lot of sense. Well, th thank you very much, Dr. Dash. That was really terrific.